It all started when I found out at the age of 23, 24 that I couldn't have children and I was devastated by this news and I decided that if I couldn't be a mother I would join the Department of Foreign Affairs and have a life of glamour and travel. Uh, so I joined up and I was hoping to go to exotic glamorous places like Paris or Rome or London where I thought I'd swan around in a black cocktail dress and get seduced by James Bond tights. But my first posting was Phnom Penh at the beginning of the Vietnam War and it was anything but glamorous. But there's something about Cambodia that just grabbed me. It was sad, it was tragic, it was beautiful, it was violent. Sometimes countries just do that to you and I was hooked. It wasn't until the coup happened in 1997 uh, where the royal family was exiled and they all ran for their lives, including the staff at the orphanage. And there was nobody there to, to look after the kids. Uh, so it, it just fell into my lap. I was pretty much left holding the baby. And uh, when I realised that there was nobody else to do it, it was like a thunderbolt in the head. You know, Geraldine, this is going to be your life. The most frightening and scary moment of my life was the day after the coup when I had soldiers coming out to the orphanage trying to shoot us off the land because it had been a previous military barracks. They were pointing their guns at the kids and we were shouting at them and I was screaming at them uh, and all of a sudden the head soldier looked, leaned forward and he looked me up and down, looked me up and down and then he nudged the soldier next to him, put his gun down, and the second soldier leaned forward and had a really, really good look at me, and he put his gun down. And within a minute or two, they'd all put their guns down, and there was about five or six of them. And they got on their tank and they left. And we went back into the dining room and, and the kids were wetting their pants and laughing at the same time. We were all in shock. And then the older boys started to laugh. And I said, what's so funny? And they said, oh, mum, it was your hair that saved us. Now, in Cambodia, they are a delightful mix of very superstitious people. They believe in ghosts and goblins and spells, all of that. And the older boys told me there's a very, very powerful witch in Cambodia that all the women go to when their husbands are unfaithful. And this witch is famous for turning the errant husband's penises to the size of a pea. And she's got red hair. And the teenage boys reckoned that for sure the soldiers saw my hair and thought, not taking any chances here. Uh, she might be related to this witch, so we're out of here. Having all the kids call me Big Mum is just wonderful. Uh, as a woman who could never have her own children, I've got hundreds of kids running around calling me Big Mum. And it's probably unprofessional for the head of a charity and a non-government organisation to have all the kids yelling out Big Mum, but I love it. Don't give a stuff what people think. It's really hard. Get, to get across to the Western world what it's like for women in Cambodia when their husbands desert them or die and they don't have any income any longer. Uh, I recently had a woman called Raxmay bring her three little girls to me. As she said, her husband had been killed by a landmine and she'd lost her job in a garment factory and she and the girls had only had water for three days. She said that the day before, a man offered her $600 for her eldest, a nine-year-old girl, to go and train in a child brothel. And Rex May said to me, I never want to sell my girls, but if I don't eat soon, I may have to sell one to keep the other two. Will you take them? So of course I did, but a woman like Rex May, who's lost all her income and her husband, she's literate, she couldn't read or write. Her only choices in life, and other women like her in Cambodia, she's got four choices and they are to starve, to beg, to steal, or to become a prostitute. So she went into town, she became a prostitute. She has HIV now, she visits the kids about twice a year. And we have no idea that women like this have to give up their children. There's no Centrelink or Red Cross or um, soup kitchens or anything like that, N nothing. So a woman like Raxmay, they are the choices that she's faced with. And Sunrise is able to help these people. I've got so many tragic stories about the kids, I don't know whose story to tell. Uh, we've just recently had a little girl called Sri Lin. She came to us with her mother because she had been raped repeatedly at the age of eight by a man in the village and she would keep on coming home and it was clear to her mother when she undressed every night that she'd been raped. And the mother reported uh, officially to the police in her village and they would never do anything about arresting this man because the, the mother didn't have enough money uh, to pay the police to do their job. So the mother came to us and she said, well, I can feed my child, but I can't protect her. And so we took Australia in 
And I have to tell you, it was a wicked thing that I had to send a nine-year-old girl off to have STD tests. But she's adjusting well, doing quite well at school, and uh, now calls Sunrise her home. And then we've got another girl called Wow, whose mother sold her into a begging ring in Pattaya. And she remembers, she was about seven or eight, and she can remember her mother saying, uh, you go with this lady now, and seeing the money change hands. And she lived in a, a quite a big house in Patty with a whole lot of other professional beggars. They were, they were fed, but they were kept in dirty clothes. And every morning the car would take them out to their various spots in the city where they would beg from. And then after some time, Wow was told she wasn't getting enough money in her cup. And she was held down and they got a blowtorch and burned her face, burned an eye out and an ear off and left her with a horrific facial burns to make her look more appealing. She didn't go to hospital after that. The next day she's out on the streets. One day the car just didn't pick her up at the end of the day. You know, she's just like eight year old kid. She didn't know how to get home because the car always took her. Well came to us at the age of 10 with a tragic life behind her. And she is now um, 16, 17 years old. And she has got life by the tail, this girl. Um, half the hair on her head has been burnt off and won't grow, but she still puts her hair up in a ponytail and half of her head is bald. And she tosses her hair and says, I don't care, mum, this is me. And she's, you don't see a disfigurement after a while. She's just got a beautiful soul and her life is going to be happy and successful. There's another little girl called T. When she was about nine, her mother was having an affair in the village and the wife found out and she came and threw a gallon of battery acid over T and her mother while they were sleeping. T's got worse injuries than Wow. Her mother was fused to her when they got her to the hospital. They had to cut her dead mother off her. I have horrific stories like this, but I have good ones as well. I've had um, two children marry each other and they're up in Siem Reap now and they've set up their own little wedding business. You know, where you hire them to arrange your whole wedding. Um, I've got a wonderful boy called Sabuan. He's one of my older boys and he's um, the number two in an NGO called Lager, uh, where they teach academically and talented, gifted children. And he's pretty much the head honcho there. And he's wonderful because in his holidays, he comes out back to sunrise and gives workshops to the children and helps them understand what life is going to be like outside. Um, I've got an, another older boy who's nearly 30 now. He was a child soldier. He came to us when he was about 12. He'd killed people when he came to us. And he's now uh, working for a big IT company on the help desk. They all find their little niche in life and it's just so rewarding for me to see these kids living really happy, normal lives. My first boy graduated from the Cordon Bleu International Hotel Training School just a couple of months ago. And I went to a big black formal dinner at the Adelaide Convention Centre where he's graduating there with his black cape and his hat. And I was so proud. And this boy, before he came to Sunrise, used to sleep in the cow shed with the cows. And they've all got these horrific backgrounds, but when they come to Sunrise, their lives change forever. We saw the need for a place that would cater specifically to HIV children. A lot of HIV children are not accepted in the schools and they are treated like third class citizens. There's a lot of ignorance about the disease. And the children we've got at our new orphanage um, it will take 200 children. At the moment, we've got about 70 or 80 and they're coming in dribs and drabs all the time. By the end of the year, I think we'll probably have about 200. But they've all been born with HIV and you cannot get a more innocent person than a child that's been born with HIV. We get free drugs, uh, all responding well. We don't have any really sick kids. We did lose one last year, but that was because he came to us too late and he already had a serious infection and then he got dengue fever. Um, but generally, all the kids are thriving. And what we plan to do for these children as they get older, the oldest ones at the moment are only 12. Uh, when they get to 18 and we've got them into a school, when they graduate from grade 12, we have wonderful corporate friends in Australia that are going to come up and teach the kids how to run a small business, how to manage a budget. Uh, you don't need a university degree to have a bike repair shop or an IT shop or a hairdressing salon. So they're going to come up and we will give seed money to these kids to start up their own businesses because no one's going to give them jobs. So we see uh, them as having a secure future by helping them set up their own business and be independent.
What's really rewarding for me is that I know once those kids walk through those sunrise gates, they might not know it, but I know their lives are changed forever for the better. And I tell them, the worst is over, darling. Everything's going to be all right now. <laughs>